About two weeks ago, Google launched its Valentine's Day game, Pangolin Love, and the web was full of pictures of the scaly animal. The pangolin is a tree-dwelling species in serious danger of extinction. It's the world's most illegally traded animal. And this animal was the animal that Mary Douglas, 20 years, eight old, uh, 20 years old, encountered in 1949 during her anthropology anthropological fieldwork among the Lele, an ethnic group in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. She identified the pangolin as an abominable and inedible animal in the context of the Lele's understanding of their universe, but also at the center of their most powerful fertility ritual. And this apparent contradiction between the sacred and the profane resonated with deeper personal questions related to her upbringing at the Sacred Heart Convent in London after her mother's death when she was 12 years old, and puzzles around hierarchy and faith and mysteries such as virgin birth and pangolin contradictions propelled her into a lifelong search for a sociological theory of meaning. Such a theory, she believed, could make original contributions to the great social science debate of her day. The nature of the relation between how people live together and how they think and believe together. The relation between the social and the symbolic world. A sociological theory of meaning, she believed, would be able to explain people's strong feelings about seemingly trivial mundane ways in which they organize their lives. But it would also help to explain and to develop alternative perspectives on macro-social phenomena, such as religion, nationalism, and the great social ills, conflict, war, violence, inequality, famines. She published her first book in 1950 after her first year of fieldwork peoples of the Lake Nyasa region at the International Africa Institute. The Leila of the Kasai was published 13 years later and described by herself as a result of her doing total anthropology, starting with the shape of the huts and technology and work and so on. By now, it seemed obvious that she would develop into a classical Africanist, following teachers such as Audrey Richard, Evans Pritchard, and a contemporary Victor Turner. But then in 1966, 45 years old, she published the book that made her famous, Purity and Danger. And here she turned her gaze from small-scale societies to the complexities of the modern industrialized world and inward to her own experiences. With some self-relativism, she later told that she wrote the book while she was having mums, the boff in Dutch. On the second page, she describes her sense of unease when making use of a properly clean bathroom, otherwise constructed and decorated as a corridor. Her own viscerally sensed discomfort with the confusion of categories helped her think of ordering as a creative art, a creative act. Mundane ordering activities, Douglas maintains, create unity of experience that has a moral code, a moral core. They can be studied as rituals. I believe I was the one to suggest to Karen Mary Douglas as a female candidate for the series of lectures. Indeed, before I became a medical anthropologist and Africanist, Douglas' work inspired me in my undergraduate and graduate studies in symbolic anthropology and in Tibetology. Exactly 30 years ago, I used Mary Douglas' theory to understand, in debate with Sherry Ortner's thesis, the universal devaluation of women. I also used her work to explain why Ladakhi women are not allowed to touch the plow that opens the earth the first step in the cyclical transformation of nature into culture, and why the plow, when not in use, is stored in the stable, where animal and human excrements are gathered. Standing here to deliver a lecture on Mary Douglas does serve me right, but I must admit that I panicked when I realized the task ahead. Mary Douglas has been one of the most productive anthropologists, public, publishing a book or collection of essays or lectures 
on the most widely differing topics every second or third year of her long career, a career that culminated in her being knighted by the king. Queen. I gathered her books in my possession around me, opened one, started reading, got captivated all over again, and realized that I would have to reread them all again, read much more, now with a more mature brain, if I wanted to be able to do justice to this great social scientist. Out of sheer necessity, and lucky for you, I gave up on the idea of giving you an overview of her life and work. There exist several excellent biographies and obituaries that you can turn to. Instead, I will focus on the two interrelated themes that she passionately investigated in parallel approaches. One is the phenomenon of ordering, which she studied through the window of disorder. The second is the search for the fundamental social processes that underlie how specific communities experience some implicit knowledge as too true to warrant discussion. And the theoretical model she developed to study the role of such knowledge in cultural conflicts. And in the final part, I will reflect on her contemporary influence and on the research agenda that I feel we could develop from her work. And I will propose some questions we could ask and some topics of broad and current interest today that such an agenda could address. If you wake up any sleeping anthropologist of my generation and would ask, Mary Douglas, what do you think? I bet many of us would simply blurt out, dirt is matter out of place. Douglas approached the relation between people's social order and their symbolic order, not by focusing on order. Instead, she used dirt, what is discarded, abhorred and feared as a window to what order is about. On the surface, Douglas' perspective on the relation between people's ideas and their social organization is often labeled as functionalist. And indeed, she agrees with Durkheim on three of his major points. That religion is socially determined, that religion expresses social reality, and that it can be instrumentally used. She criticizes Levi-Strauss for his focus on the forms of symbols rather than on the social relations and people's ambitions and desires to which these symbols refer. And in several publications, she condemns the arbitrary separation of ideas from the institutions in which these ideas work. And I quote, as if mind were out there and existent disembodied, supported by nothing, but somehow powerfully influencing the solidly physical institutions in curious ways. Cognitions, Douglas maintains, always need to be anchored in the social political realities in which they are produced. But cognitions being anchored and rooted in social political realities, in particular forms of social experience, is not the same as being determined by social structure. In her book, Natural Symbols, she tells us that it is not correct to speak of substructure and superstructure. Society and culture are both abstractions of processes that in the final instance consist of individuals relating to other individuals. In her introduction to her 1975 collection of essays, she argues that in specific ecological and historical contexts, people simultaneously create patterns of society, of living together, and organize knowledge, produce beliefs and ritual in compatible patterns. The motivating power behind this twofold construction of reality is that people need order, regulation, structuring to be able to live together. The same energy, she says, that constrains disruptive passions and creates a certain pattern of society also organizes knowledge in a compatible, workable, usable form. Now please note the active form, the active mode, but also the reference to specific ecological and historical contexts in which these creative activities take place. This is far away from 
uh, blunt social determinism. And much more closer uh, to Bourdieu's concept of habitus and to the way in which practice theorists, and I'm citing Sherry Ortner, try to overcome the theoretical juxtaposition of structure, the social world has constituted, and agency, the interested practices of people. So if the simultaneous creation of patterns of society and patterns of beliefs is order, in Douglas' perspective, where do we find this order? And what is its role in ritual? Douglas argues that during the construction process, arbitrary choices are made. Other structures of society and cosmos can always be imagined. This order is people's experience of the arbitrary boundedness of order and of the dangers from without these boundaries. The core thesis of purity and danger is that arbitrary choices cannot but create ambivalences and anomalies and that pollution ideas project, uh, protect where ambivalences and anomalies threaten the construction. In this vein, she analyzes Leviticus and shows us how the pig escapes the logical categories of pure and impure animals that serve the Jewish boundary management system. In Leila Animal Taxonomy, the pangolin represents the essential anomaly it combines all the categories that the lele in their daily life try to keep apart. It has scales, like a fish, but it climbs in trees. It resembles a lizard, but it suckles its offspring. Like humans, it gives, it gives birth to only one young at a time, twins at the most. But the cult around this animal posed Douglas for a fundamental question. Why do the lele choose this taxonomic monster that in their daily life only evokes disgust for their supreme fertility ritual, where initiated men solemnly slaughter and eat it. How do we interpret the apparent mixing of the sacred and the profane? Rituals, so tells Douglas, teach us that disorder is not only negative. Disorder, because it has no clear shape, also represents unlimited possibilities. Disorder is both a side product of ordering and the raw material that enables innovation. Any perfect order results in rigidity. It is the enemy of creativity and to life itself. Douglas argues that no society can survive if it does not come to terms with the unity of experience. One can try to separate good and evil, life and death, but both sides belong to human existence. Rigid prevention of the blurring of categories prevents procreation and fertility. What a normal life represents disorder can be used in ritual contexts as a source of creative power. One can drink and eat the blood and body of Christ and not be classified as a cannibal. The mayor and other powers that be in a village in Limburg may be ridiculed by other citizens during carnival. Children may tease their parents by writing naughty poems on Sinterklaas evening. And the netmaster may crack disrespectful jokes on board of the ship until he has to take charge of the nets. Now, not all of these examples are of Mary Douglas herself, of course, but this is her point. A ritual embracement of disorder, of uprooting hierarchy and structure, taps into the creative powers of disorder and expresses the notion that human existence consists of both elements, order and disorder, life and death, the pure and the impure. The Lele cult, she says, is only one example of which many more could be cited of cults with invited initiates to turn around and confront the categories on which their whole surrounding culture has been built up and to recognize them for the fictive man-made arbitrary creations that they are. Now this analysis is all nicely coherent and, I must say, aesthetically satisfying. But in the book that made her famous, 
There is no answer to the question why confrontations with such deep existential truths among the initiates would work out for the good of the group. Why the solemn eating of the pangolin would help the group's women to become fertile. More than 20 years after her last field research, Mary Douglas laments uh, the poor quality of her fieldwork and the un incomplete data that resulted from it. Because her material was poor, she tells us, she could not answer the question why the pangolin had so much power within the terms of the Lele culture itself. She could not do a true semantic analysis and link the pangolin as a symbol to their submerged assumptions about how the universe worked, the cosmic themes of divine kinship and the constitution of human nature. Because her material was poor, she tells us, she was driven to consider the matter, that is, why the pangolin has so much power, under its more general aspect. The general question being, how can we recognize pangolin power elsewhere, and what does its power rely on? The older Douglas looks back at her earlier work with some embarrassment and fundamental criticism. She chastises herself for what she calls the rather lame conclusions of her own work, where she took recourse to the structuralist idea that there is a, human, a universal human tendency to pass negative judgment on anything that doesn't fit in the tidy compartments of the mind and a universal need to recognize and transcend their facticity, their man-madeness. She had swept under the carpet the contrast between the abominable pig that would never make it to a redeeming ritual and the sacred pangolin. She had herself not done what she had preached. At at the final instance, purity and danger was an analysis of a system of ideas without any demonstration of how these ideas related with the dominant concerns of the Leila themselves or the Israelites who use these systems for thinking with. It was only by focusing on these concerns that she started to understand why ambiguous beings are strictly abominable in one culture and are embraced as mediators in another. I cannot go into her step-by-step -step analysis here of the Leilas and, and the Israelites and other people's experiences of, as a people, but the analysis leads her to conclude that each construction of the natural world, um, the contrast between man and non-man, provides an analogy for the contrast between the member of the human community and the outsider. If the social institutions allow for a rewarding exchange with outsiders, such as uh, with the Lele who favor trade, then we have the conditions for positive mediators. But a people surrounded by powerful enemies and disastrous experiences with outsiders will try to strictly fence its boundaries, protect its purity with rigid structures, and in the same move, not tolerate hybrids for fear of pollution. In this work of culture, people make use of the symbols provided by nature. People's preoccupation with boundaries is not only at stake in classifications of the animal world, but in particular the human body as a highly complex and bounded system where things go in and out proves to be universally useful as a model for society. The body is a natural symbol, not in the sense that any of its components, functions or characteristics are directly related to meanings. The head may stand for many different things in different cultures, as may the feet. But there is great similarity in how the relation between the head and the feet, between the mouth and the anus, usually expresses hierarchy and is associated with both social control and control over bodily functions. We have to be very careful here not to misunderstand the relation between how people experience social and symbolic dangers. The similarities we see in how communities try to protect themselves from strangers and how to protect their bodies from pollution and their intolerance or tolerance of hybrid beings 
are not projections of people's human society upon the body or upon animal categories. It is not a similarity based on metaphor. Fear for pollution or hybrid beings do not stand for xenophobia. The point is, Douglas tells us, that the same categories that people use for explaining their own behavior, they also use for predictions in the natural world. The connection is non-metaphorical. The similarities we see result from the fact that these fears are construed upon the same principles. So pangolin power is related to the social structuring of our societies and to the related implicit social structurings of our minds. Pangolin power is dangerous because we cannot reveal its arbitrariness without destroying the social and symbolic universe it upholds. Pangolin power is mysterious because it is shaped by the social consensus on the non-arbitrariness of the universe, the exact social uh, consensus it protects. My intention, Douglas tells us in a lecture for the Royal Anthropological Institute in 1972, and for those who read the work by uh, Daniel Kahneman, I don't, don't know how to pronounce this, on uh, thinking fast and slow, you, you can really read him into her work. My intention, she, she says, was to show how a gut reaction is founded. Knowledge in the bones, a gut response, answers to a characteristic in the total pattern of classification. Something learned for the first time can be judged instantly and self-evidently true or false. This flash of recognition would correspond to the split-second scanning of animal knowledge. The essence of my argument is that the stable point points of reference for this kind of knowing are not particular external events, but the characteristics of the classification system itself. We are talking, she says, about the way the system has been set. It may be a setting that welcomes some anomalies and rejects others, or one that rejects all anomalies. Using such a classification system, there is no need to work out by slow deductive processes how to respond to a new anomaly that turns up. This argument is not developed in order to serve as an aid for interpreting the bizarre classifications of exotic civilizations. It relates to arguments between logicians about how relations of identity are constituted, not by primitives, but by ourselves." End quote. For Mary Douglas, Unlike Levi Strauss and like Evans Pritchard, it made no sense to believe in a fundamental difference between primitive and modern cognitive styles. She reasoned, if we know how the inarticul inarticulate, implicit areas of Leila consciousness, their gut feelings of self-evident truth are socially constituted, we should be able to apply that lesson also to our modern complex world. And not only to religion and cosmologies, but also to secular knowledge, to what we believe is objective scientific truth. Even the truth of science, she writes, quoting Wittgenstein, is established by social process and protected by convention. Surely, she says, it's an anachronism to believe that our world is more securely founded in knowledge than one that is driven by pangolin power. Douglas found regularities in her comparisons of body symbolism, and she had to qualify her cultural relativism because of that. Each means of communication, to some extent, she says, determines what can be communicated. And it does this by offering certain possibilities, but by also offering or carrying certain limitations. And it is this fact which allows us to look for universal patterns in how the body, ambiguous beings, and other natural symbols are used in otherwise contextually and socially grounded symbolism. Now she embarked on a quest for a cultural theory of risk that would link people's understandings of and reactions to danger and risk with different social structures, 
a theory that would help understand cultural change, identifying organizational change in, uh, in, in which these uh, cultural changes were founded, and predict the economic and political changes the change will bring about. And now I'm sure that by sheer gut feeling, anthropologists who hold their abstinence for hypothesis uh, sacred would swipe her to the left. And why not to the right? Would be answered, of course, by Mary Douglas. The basis of her theory is that there are only a limited number of elementary forms available for people to organize, organize themselves internally and in relation with others. And you have to please remember that her theory, because some people feel that this theory was construed for an analyzing everything, but it was, it was developed as a theory to think about how people think about risk and dangers in the environment and, and in their own world. The anthropological theory of culture and I'm going to just read it because I can't, I can't uh, express it better than she does. This theory starts from the distribution in a community of different attitudes to authority and fairness. Thus, it directly addresses divergent ideas of justice and different allocations of blame. Furthermore, the theory starts from social organization. In any community, the holders of power and their rivals, critics and opponents will have a limited range of strategies for securing their positions and dealing with criticism. Any social field, she argues, has, has two dimensions that may vary from lower to higher levels. Structural constraints relating to the level of internal organization, grid, and group constraints relating to their relation with others, that is, the level of group loyalty that is asked from individuals, group. Now, this leads to four cultural types produced by different possible combinations of these two dimensions of social control. The development and application of what she calls her favorite schema that came to be known as grid and group has taken up a large part of her career. And there's a reason why I'm not immediately showing you a diagram, but I'm waiting a little bit, because when you look at her work, you can see that the diagrams that she used for her thinking started, uh, changed with almost every new print of her book. And she, she, she thought with, with these diagrams, and this is a characteristic of her work, what it makes, so dif makes it so difficult to talk about Mary Douglas, because there are so many the Mary Douglas is in the course of her own life. In natural symbols, she used her schema mostly to think about the differences between different, mostly small-scale societies. In her later work, where contemporary complex modern societies become more prominent, she recognized that societies cannot be placed in one compartment of the model as a whole, but that in each society conflicting cosmologies are always at play. I think she gives the best overview of her thinking in her 1990 essay on governance, which was published in her um, uh, book Thought Styles in 1996. Any community, so this is the, the group and grid, and you see on the horizontal line weak and strong group, and on the vertical line weak and strong grid. She says, any community has an embryo, all four cultural types, each in debate with the other, each anchored in a particular relation to power and authority. And each type is in tension with the rest. In any society, different actors struggle to impose their preferred way of organizing on all of the others. Any cultural controversy, any cultural conflict can be uh, typified as a debate between these four positions. One cultural position, and that is the upper right hierarchy, is that of commitment to authority exercised through traditional rules and asking for high group loyalty. Here personhood is constructed as needing structure. 
the opposite style, right on the bottom, the enclavists, they celebrate egalitarianism. People taking this position object to hierarchy and distinctions of rank. But like hierarchists, they believe in group loyalty, making their individual desires subservient to the group. Communities at this side of the spectrum are usually weakly organized. They lack leadership in the same way as they lack a system of political rewards and sanctions. They can only co control by scorn or ridicule or appeal to its values. They thrive when they can protest to something, as this helps to appeal to solidarity of the to the group. They have an image of um, personhood as persons under duress. And this cultural position is where we would find, according to Douglas, minorities or sects or enclaves in complex society. In full opposition to hierarchy, where you see individualism, is where neither commitment to authority nor group commitment can be detected. And this is the position of the individualist. The true individualist is all for himself, but make no mistake, Douglas warns, like the hierarchist, the individualist does not object to power, he wants it. And here, in this part, the individual is constructed or construed as robust. And fully opposed to the egalitarian is the fatalist, the isolate, as she calls it in other publications, who lives in a structure which others have organized, but who is not bounded by group loyalty. And here we find the poor, the unorganized migrants and refugees, the unemployed. And there is a sense of unpredictability attached to ideas of personhood in this quarter. In her later work, she uh, identified a fifth position, that of the hermit, who completely withdraws from any ordering as such in the center, but I will not go into that here. Now, Douglas and others she worked with, in particular Aaron Wildowski, apply this model for thinking about social uh, organization and cultural positioning to very diverse topics in any field where cultural conflicts could be identified. In her book, Thought Styles, she analyzes attitudes uh, towards the spiritual or taste in furnishing. Feelings of unease, she says, are indicators of threats to the implicit ordering underlying cultural styles. Think of receiving a birthday gift that embarrasses you. Is it perhaps because it will give others the wrong impression of your identity in the hierarchy of taste? Douglas writes on fashion, on lifestyles, from not wanting to be seen dead in certain clothes. And these topics are enjoyable to read about. Recognition may sometimes cause slight embarrassment and surprise. Who likes to think of him or herself to be captured in a particular cultural style related to particular organizational um, uh, fundaments? But when her analysis comes closer to the skin, it is more difficult to digest that the truth one experiences in a particular way of being in the world, a particular way of perceiving the world, a particular way of wanting to organize the world is only, always only, one of four positions and not necessarily the most effective one. Her analysis of cultural styles regarding the environment made her very unpopular among the American env environmentalist movement of the 1980s. Make it what you will, she says, the cultural challenge is, is a reaction of benefits from modern industrial society. This is how she characterizes them. And I'm sorry for the bad picture, but it is better for me than opening the book here. These are two pages in um, uh, one of her books. Um, and what you see here is how relations between experiences of personhood and perspectives on nature are construed together. The, uh, other people um, made the pictures in different thought styles. So if you look at the bottom one, it says nature under duress, and it says person under duress. 
And this is where she placed the environmentalists. So the environmentalists are placed in the low hierarchy, high group uh, quarter. Remember the right hand side down. Um, and if you construe both nature and the person under duress and you are internally not accepting hierarchy, this leads to Douglas um, accusing the environmentalists of that time of being ineffective. Groups taking this cultural position, Ro Douglas, may show short bursts of collaboration, but they have a problem with long-term goals. And now I would like you to take, by the way, our own Rethink UVA, and especially how that happened in the anthropology department in your mind. I'm starting again. Groups taking this cultural position, Ro Douglas, may show short bursts of collaboration, but they have a problem with long-term goals and stable collaboration as long as they object to specialized organization. She criticizes the environmentalists for their ineffectiveness. If the issue of the environment would be identified as a cultural conflict, the debate would concentrate on justice, on the kind of society that would be compatible with an environment under continual scrutiny and control. So please notice that Douglas did not designate any of the four thought styles as the perfect solution. That would be an absurd position for someone who believes in the creative power of disorder and the pangolin power related to the arbitrariness of all orders. So although in real life, politically, she identified most with the hierarchist position for its effectivity, but she hated Thatcher, whom she placed, of course, in the lower left um, bottom place of the individualist. Um, although all of that, her research could, could only lead her to a holistic conclusion. Politics, she says, that aim to improve people's life must somehow include all perspectives. Including all perspectives is the only way out of being steered by pangolin power, by a priori self-evident truths that result from deep implicit similarities between arbitrary man-made social structures and man-made systems of belief. The only way forward is to explore the cultural biases of what each group, including those that we belong to ourselves, holds sacred or abominable. We must be aware of institutions and social structures that they are grounded, in which they are grounded and which they serve, and only then is deliberate decision-making regarding what is fair and what is just as possible. <coughs> Sorry. The more recent Douglas work, particularly regarding her cultural theory, the more it became applied and taken forward with success out, outside of anthropology. And Douglas regretted this, but it did not keep her from pursuing her research interests over what she saw as ab arbitrary boundaries between the sciences. In the sociologies of organization, governance, and risk and conflict, in social ecology and technology studies, her theory was applied to numerous topics. It was rephrased and improved, often in, in dialogue with Douglas herself. It proved to be applicable, particularly in fields where people disagree over public issues. Some of her core hypotheses were tested by survey methods. But in sociology, there is also criticism when people are thinking about what was done with her work. Um, the criticism is that many of these studies, interesting as they are, result in mere descriptions of where groups are positioned in relation to certain cultural conflicts. Her older work, Purity and Danger, and to some lesser extent Natural Symbols, and many of her creative essays, were well received in anthropology, probably because this earlier work fitted anthropology's preoccupations with meanings, the turn to the mundane and away from exotic small-scale societies. 
I have already mentioned that if we forego the modern anthropological jargon, we would realize there's an unbroken line from Douglas to practice theory. And there's an excellent article on this by the sociologist Marco Verwey that I hope all of you will read at some point, 2007. He's in Germany. Um, I'll send you the <laughs> citations later. But when we look for direct influences, we may say Douglas profoundly influenced mostly interpretive anthropological research. In medical anthropology, where interpretive approaches flourish, her perspectives on pollution underpin anthropological studies of hygiene that my professor Sjaak van der Gees has been very active in. And historical and cultural studies of infectious disease many of my colleagues are working in. They play a role in the ethnography of care. Her work prominently shaped anthropology's turn to the body. And this was particularly helped by Sheepa Hughes and Locke's agenda setting paper, The Mindful Body. Studies of risk and reproduction, studies into, into alternative sexuality and gender identity, queer studies, studies of racism, of humor, all pay at some point tribute to this godmother of anthropology of everyday life and the anthropology of science. But does all of this answer to what Douglas would have wanted? Is pangolin power central enough to our agenda? To some extent, yes. I think many of the topics I mentioned already fit such an agenda. For as long as we study people's meaning making in relation to their building of the social world, for as long as we accept that cognitions are anchored in particular forms of social experience, for as long as we do not believe the one is substructuring the other, but they are co-created in intricate ways, for as long as we can live with the paradox that there are fundamentally different social worlds inhabited by people with fundamentally different subjectivities, for as long as we agree that contradictions and ambiguities supported by implicit meanings and a priori notions of truth can never be solved for good, if all of that, some of that or most of that is the case, I believe Douglas' again, agenda is carried forward. But let me venture on a few suggestions for strengthening, strengthening a pangolin power agenda. Most of them are not new. And my listing there, them here is meant as a matter of prioritizing work that already is going on in many of our departments. First, I'm neither sociologist nor political or economic scientist, but I hope my colleagues will hear the call in sociology to develop cultural theory to a higher level of explanation so that it can provide alternate explanations of the world's pertinent social phenomena, including terrorism, civil conflicts and the like. Douglas at some point, I haven't read the thesis, but I heard it referred to, at some point analyzed Al-Qaeda's cultural position as enclavists in the grand scheme of things. And she concluded that the USA government should not just fight them, but also dialogue with them, that there was no other way. Similarly, the focus on pangolin power could throw new light on the current president of the United States' claims to alternate, alternative versions of self-evident truth, his border management, his withdrawal from the world's agreements on climate change, his arguments against vaccination because it would cause autism, and his style of internal organization, setting up his own staff members against one another. This slide may also lead to pertinent questions of how to change the institutions that support this position. This position, which coincides with the cultural style that now throws so many individuals and groups in the isolation of the upper left-hand corner of the schema. Second, and this is deeply personal, as a Tibetologist and Africanist, I also urge for a reapplication of her work to cultural conflicts elsewhere. How can pangolin power help us to understand and perhaps help intervene on the transgenerational cycles of violence in some African regions? 
the increasing and unintended influence of evangelical churches on people's interpretation of evil and troubling phenomena such as witch children, the horrendous stigmatization and ritual killings of people with albinism and the social repression of homosexuality. And is there something cultural theory can cont contribute to the understanding and intervention on the, uh, in the ongoing marginalization and domination of the Tibetan people, including the incredible destruction of their natural environment since China incorporated their country in the 1950s? Third, a focus on pangolin power is needed to monitor and unravel the social, structural and experiential underpinnings that are leading to major reconstructions in terms of authority and fairness of European care systems. In the Netherlands, youth care is being reorganized in terms of people's eigen kracht, people's own strength. Internationally, it's now more popular to speak of resilience than to speak of vulnerability. Changes in jargon, to some extent, but simultaneously reflecting profound cha profoundly changing notions of personhood and distributions of power in the field of health and well-being. Fourth, I would plead for strengthening the application of the perspective to fields where the same ordering energy is at work that steer the layless elaborate animal classification system. Here we see ever more elaborate identifications of difference, wearing a cloak of a priori or moral or scientific truth. One may think of the current discussion of biological underpinnings of autism, fueled by big data research and moral arguments, and read the column that uh, Trudy de You wrote in the Volkskrant this week. But one could also think of the increasing labeling of difference in gender and sexuality identities. Think of the decision to add a plus to LGBTQIA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, intersexual and asexual, and the plus then meaning uh, or hoping to prevent having to label each and every variety on the spectrum. A Douglasian question would be how these increasingly more complex cultural systems of classifications of difference and attitudes and acceptance of ambiguity relate to how people represent different thought styles and how they organize themselves internally and the relation with others. And fifth and finally, to make the pangolin power agenda relevant, there are sacred epistemological and disciplinary boundaries that must be crossed, exactly as Douglas did herself. This does not only talk about cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary collaborations between the different social sciences, but also between the social sciences, the humanities, medicine, and harder science. Now, what role would anthropology play in such an interdisciplinary agenda? First, it would have to be willing to investigate the sacred a priori of our own field and relate them to our own boundary management and positioning in the field of science. On the positive side, Douglas' work teaches us that anthropology can make a unique contribution. Anthropology can help link research on the micro level of people's mundane lives their desires and passions, the concerns that steer their social navigation with relevant macro politics and dynamics. This may enable us, for instance, to connect the waning of the Polonaise as a cultural form during Carnival with Dutch villagers' percef perceived danger of refugees and macroeconomic processes catapulting whole regions in the Netherlands in decline and marginalization. Conflict studies, I believe, form the perfect arena for developing such an interdisciplinary research agenda. And I have particularly high hope for the further development of anthropologies and sociologies, most underdeveloped field, the social science of emotions. The social constitution of gut feelings, as Douglas called them, are the window to understanding the major cultural conflicts of our time. 
This is my last slide, and to honor Mary Douglas' idea of ring composition, I will end with what I started with, the pangolin, on the brink of extinction in both Africa and Asia. In Chinese medicine, pangolin power is used for healing, and this is a major energy behind the worldwide illegal trade in its body parts. Would it not be terrible that pangolin power would remain one of anthropology's great concepts and the real pangolin would be extinct due to the implicit meaning we, the greatest predators of the earth, ascribe to it? Please visit the website. Save the pangolins. Thank you.